Hare Krishna, Kosta Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. It's wonderful Thank to you. see you once again. It is always an honor to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. So, you know, we have had two podcasts in the past. First time we discussed about in general Western outreach. And we focused on your experiences with Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Radhanath Maharaj and how Bhakti Center and other yoga, especially the yoga outreach started. And then second time we discussed mm -hmm. about postmodernism and how it presents a challenge uh, when we try to present Bhagavat, Bhagavatam wisdom. Right. So you have been probably uh, the most successful devotee doing Western outreach on a regular cons consistent basis through the through the uh, <clears throat> wisdom of the sages podcast and you know, I find three things amazing about it. First is that you get a good number of audience daily hearing live and afterwards through the downloads or hearing serious Bhagavatam. Mm, you're not... Uh, it's not always serious. <laughs> no. What I mean serious, serious in one sense. No, I, I'll yeah. explain what I mean by serious Bhagavatam. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is Bhagavatam. It is yeah. okay. So the, the content is the Bhagavatam. The mode of presentation may be personal, lively, humorous, yeah. but the content itself is Bhagavatam. And you're not uh, dodging difficult parts from the Bhagavatam or anything like that. So mm. that's that's a yeah, we could say maybe rather than score Bhagavatam, we can say solid Bhagavatam stuff we are discussing. Okay, sure. That's a that's the, that's the first amazing thing. And second is that also you have uh, you have developed that rapport with the audience by which. You know which parts to emphasize, which which they can accept, which they can relate with, and those which are not so not so easy to understand. You explain adequately, but you don't don't uh, you could say obsess over them too much. So knowing what the audience needs are, I think that's also a reason why people keep coming. So hmm. and that brings us to the third part, which I thought we uh, we could focus on is that. You know, in general, most people, unless they are of a very academic orientation, they turn towards wisdom texts uh, for, you could say, adding value to their life, for learning something practical. So, mm -hmm. so for them, when they are even either rationally evaluating or ethically analyzing or whatever they are doing, all that is at one level subordinate to the point of how it will add value to my life. So I thought we could discuss from that topic today that, that you know, how can we present Bhagavatam in a way that the audience feels that it adds value to their life. So we could say finding the practical in the scriptural. Now practical can seem a little too utilitarian, but it's that's why I thought it's more of adding value. It could be not just, okay, what I should do, but it could be emotional value, it could be intellectual value. It could be action-oriented value. So is this an approach that you consciously chose or it is just something which has organically developed over the years in your uh, in your presenting the Bhagavatam? Um, I think it's uh, something that we chose, but that has also organically developed. In other words, you, you I think that you could say that that is how we're trying to present Bhagavatam. Like, in other words, what is relevant about it um, and how that gets communicated, I think, has kind of developed somewhat organically. Um, but, you know, it, it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a study of Bhagavatam, but I don't consider myself like a, a scholar of the Bhagavatam, or, you know, myself or Raghunath Prabhu. I, I don't know Sanskrit. Um, I haven't, you know, I've read, of course, Prabhupada's commentaries. I haven't read other commentaries at length. You know, a lot of the philosophical schools that the Bhagavatam is engaging with, I just have very, you know, a beginner's knowledge of. Um, so I don't see myself, I have an interest in Bhagavatam scholarship. You know, if someone is a scholar, I'm interested to hear from them. But I don't consider myself a scholar. Um, but I, I suppose what I see, what we're trying to do, what our role is, is, is it largely about um, trying to just communicate it or to try to help... Um, bridge the gap between our own cultural conditioning and, you know, kind of reaching, you know, giving access to um, 
what is there that is that does add value to our life and and so i think you know one could look at Shrimad Bhagavatam, one would likely look at it and see this is a very ancient book, uh, which in one sense gives it authenticity and, and, and uh, you, know, you know, is, is, is something that's um, appealing about it, right? That it's something that's lasted for so long and been handed down. There must be some kind of truth there and so on. But, um, but it seems to be culturally from an age, like a, a different age, we don't even know, you know, if that age even exists, you know, like a, a skeptical person would be, I don't even know if these, you know, the, 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 the societies that they're speaking of even existed or if these are just stories. And beyond that, you know, there's so much um, rigid social structures in there that seem to really go against the grain of the way that we think mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, and and let's, so, uh, sorry, I mean, let's yeah, take yeah, these yeah. points one by one. You spoke a lot sure. of things. Okay. The first point itself you mentioned is interesting, that the the longevity of the book itself brings some credibility to it. That yeah. now this, irrespective of uh, what we, you know, the idea of survival of the fittest, mm -hmm. is something which in one sense applies everywhere. Uh, not necessarily as the entire explanation of life and its origins, but there are so many things which people could remember and uh, most things people will forget. So if some story is that generations upon generations of people for, for more than a millennia have chosen to remember and pass it on carefully, that indicates that it must have added some value to their lives. Mm. And yeah. that's why it's important for us to also consider or at least be open to so it's interesting yes. that the longevity argument or just the fact that it's ancient, it, it, it is in, like some people in India, not everyone, they say just, oh, it's just old means old fashioned. There are two screws, there's old is old fashioned and there's old is gold. So mm -hmm. it seems especially when we are reaching a contemporary audience who are already seeking some kind of Eastern wisdom, these do seem to have that attitude that there may be some gold in what is old. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. So that's the one. That's the positive, right? But then there's also the the what was what do you say? Old is old fashioned. It's oh, irrelevant yeah. or something. Yeah. I mean, that's also. I think our biggest, not exactly because it's old, even if it weren't so old, um, but that it is a lot of the the um, social ideas that are there. I think are the biggest. Um, you know, leap to take. It's, I don't even think it's so much the religious ideas, like in other words, theological ideas, concepts of God. I think our theological ideas are quite attractive actually, you know, it, with an open-minded person. Um, but I think that the, the social um, structures that you see in Bhagavatam that, and that come up again, again, and again, are gonna be the most challenging in the current climate that we're in, you know, in the in, um, triggers, you know, there's gonna be so many triggers <laughs> that are gonna be there. <laughs> For a person mm. and so um i think you and i were discuss you were on our podcast on wisdom of sages just this past weekend and um we discussed how you know there's polarities different you know people are generally especially in the current time people swing to one polarity or to another and, yeah. but often there's a um you mentioned two things we said in the middle that often you find a synthesis but then also you have to go on deeper levels. And and yes. I often I feel like our role is to take people, okay, I get it on the surface level, you're triggered by this. Can we have the patience and the open-mindedness to dig a bit deeper into this idea and to see how I get your trigger, I get the danger, I, the red flag that you're waving, that you're saying, hold it, I, I see a potential social danger here, I get that. But let's go a little bit deeper into it and see if there's something really valuable here. I, I think that's a large part of the challenge, getting someone to to open up for that mm. or being able to explain that. That is true. So by theological, you said it's attractive means the idea of, say, of a personal God or the idea of divine love. Mm -hmm. And so that is, you're saying, it's not that difficult as a social, or also, social structure. Also, the idea that, like, for instance... Um, that the soul by nature is God's energy is pure. Like that's, I think that's an attractive idea, right? Not like, 
a lot of people's okay. rebellion towards religion is like, oh, we're born sinful and, you know, and so on. So, uh, yeah, theologically, I think our idea is, you know, God is beautiful. Uh, you know, God manifests in many different ways. Um, you know, God ultimately has a kind, benevolent uh, heart. Um, y you know, um, I, I think a lot of those theological ideas, you know, God's not interested in guilt. God, this God only is interested in love, reciprocates in love in all different varieties of ways. You know, th I think those are not um, unpopular ideas. Th there's not the same kind of triggers, but in the social uh, roles and, and so on, I think that's where the biggest triggers are. Hmm. So by social roles, uh, you refer to something like Varanashram or the role of women or anything all, all else those, Yeah, I, th I think that would cover <laughs> most of it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, I suppose there are all kind of things that pop up, but pretty much everything that takes place in, you know, it, it's it's largely coming in that um, in that Varnashram Vedic paradigm. And so, yeah, I think a lot of those ideas, whether it's Varna, whether it's Ashrama, I see in my own life, I don't live in a, in a Varnashram village or I, I live in a world where these ideas are um, mostly completely unknown. Um, what to speak of outdated. They're just, they've never even been applied. Uh, most people haven't heard of them. Um, but, I, but I still feel like even if my entire world that I live in is unaware of Varnashrama, I still can draw a lot of personal value in my own life from these ideas. Um, you know, and, and, and so that's, even that's just one way of looking at it. You know, like one, you can read these books and say, okay, what's my role in this world? And what are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? And um, what kind of commitment, what kind of duty uh, could I embrace that will um, counter my lower nature? and uh you know magnify or increase my my um my the good in me so what it it's so, so you're saying that it is also a personal approach that you always have had that yeah. okay how 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 does it how do i see sometimes there is this phrase what's in it for me yeah. and sometimes that could be said uh, to be a little self-serving mm -hmm. but Another sense in the world is complex and there are so many things in the world. Unless people can see something, it's something it's something which is, unless I can find some relevance in it, I'm not going to be interested in it. And it's, it's not necessarily in that sense a negative thing. I think you know, I'm a strong believer in um, that uh, the way that we make the world a better place is to begin with ourselves. <laughs> you know, like I start with that. So, <laughs> So I, so I think on one level, I, I don't feel that it's at all selfish to be very concerned about improving oneself. And when I say what's in it for me, it's not what's in it for me to exploit others, but what's in it for me to become a better, what, what do I need to become a better person? Um, and that should play a you know, positive role socially as well. But I, I wanna be clear, I don't think, when I approach Bhagavad Gita on a personal level, it's not only that I'm thinking about how do, what do I get out of it? Or how do I improve myself? But I also have a deep faith. I'm, I, you know, call me naive or whatever it is, but I actually have belief faith that globally, you know, that, that Bhagavatam has a lot to offer. <laughs> you know, if that makes me like a, a blind follower or something, then that's who I am. But I think the principles that, that you know, that Prabhupada's mission to kind of like um, share the spiritual knowledge and specifically the knowledge of Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita I believe that th these can change the world and I, I believe that they're very relevant but in order for people to understand them we're going to have to get over a lot of uh, 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 some bumps you know and that's where we kind of have to our role becomes to kind of take someone by the hand and gain their trust and um and, and help them understand how this is relevant hmm. yeah of course in one sense unless we had that conviction that there is something of not just value but you could say almost immense, indispensable, irreplaceable value. We wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be centering our life on studying and sharing this wisdom. Yeah. So, uh, should we? You mentioned two points about uh, Varanashram. Social obstacles could be that could be one place we could start from, 
or we could start from well, some particular past times to see how how we could look at is this the practical and the scriptural how would you like mm -hmm. to go ahead with it uh, i suppose maybe we why don't we just start with option number one <laughs> if you don't mind okay sure and, and maybe the the leelas will come up naturally uh, in relation sure, yeah makes sense yeah but l let's say let's you know like maybe if if we're to say like how do i as a western person um how do i see like say instance of ashrama being relevant hmm. you know I, I i was uh born into where i didn't go to a guru kula you know um i've been married but i don't have children you know i got married in my mid-30s you know uh relatively late you know it, it's in in many ways my life i don't know if i will ever be a sannyasi you know like a, a, a lot of the um the um kind of you know we we read again and again and again in shastra about these four different stages of life hmm. but we live in a world where nobody's practicing that so how does this become relevant and, and in my own life I, I think it's it's extremely relevant actually you know but i, I suppose i could share some of some of those thoughts yes please definitely mm -hmm. um because it, you know in one sense i can what what although we don't live in a, in a varn ashram world um we get to see what a world without it looks like too and sometimes it's like kind of intense but in other words it's currently like say living in, in the united states it's not only a world that doesn't have any conception of varn ashram but it's 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 a world that um has been abandoning even what you'd call kind of like um, i don't know fundamental kind of ideas about family and 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 uh mm. duty to society and so on and, and it's become intensely focused on the individual right and the individual's pursuit of happiness but where does it lead are we becoming happier you know is the question you know so, so in one sense you can see uh, how there's a need for varnashram but you know like in my own life i i didn't go to guru i became a brahmachari at age 21 right uh, where normally you would do that at about, I don't know, age eight or so, you know, in a, in a classic Varnashram, uh, I, you know, idea. But I did find that it was a time for study. You know, I, I, had, a, I had a time in my life, early, relatively early in my life, where I was engaged in study of Shastra. All of it was theoretical, right? Like I didn't, so much, so much of it, 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 it they weren't life learned lessons. It was but it was knowledge. It was knowledge about how, you know, the modes of material nature and how they work. It was, you know, knowledge about the, the, the nature of the soul, the nature of God and so on. And it was a lot of knowledge, you know, like we read in Bhagavatam about how entangling this world becomes, how the, how the mind and the senses can become our enemies, how, how our desires tend to entangle us, how the things that we think will bring us happiness in the end often leave us, um, confused or disappointed or even in situations of great pain and as a young person you you study this you know you study this um you also learn etiquette you there's there's social ideas you know reverence for the for the teacher or, or for the elder you know self-sacrifice you know um going out you know I, I distributed books you know for for about full time you know for about 12 or 13 years and in many ways i feel like that was kind of a very brahmachari you know going out and collecting wood and serving the gurus and, and like that kind of thing you know in, in many ways although i was wandering around you know rock concerts <laughs> you know in the united <laughs> states i felt like i was you know a, a a brahmachari disciple going out and collecting the wood and bringing it back to the guru for the for a sacrifice you know uh sacrificing my own independence and you know so it was, it was a life of study and and self-sacrifice um and so, you know, my understanding is that that's that brahmachari life was it was for gaining knowledge, right? Not necessarily um, vigyana, not necessarily realized knowledge, but it's a time of life where you're, you know, where you're learning, and uh, and not and again, learning not just uh, book knowledge, but also like how to relate with others. And then you get married, you know. And the idea is that this is the one stage in life where as a yogi 
it's kind of opening it it's opening up the possibilities to engage with the things in this world that are yoga that are potentially dangerous for a yogi you know specifically mm. uh, money and sex right so like in married life you know sex the possibility of sexuality opens up and uh, you have your own job now so you're making your own money uh, the pleasures of, that that opens up you know you begin to engage with and um, and, and so there's a potential danger, but you do have the training that you've had and all the knowledge that you've had. But now what happens is the knowledge that you studied about, you're actually living it now. And mm -hmm. so although you, on one hand, a husband and wife are enjoying physically, sexually, and they're the pleasures of children, you know, the kind of joy, you know, I have never been a parent, right? You haven't either. <laughs> so we don't know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We can only witness it. But the joy that of parenthood is, is you know, people speak of it is some, there's nothing like it in the world. You know, the, the feeling uh, of, of love and the reciprocation of the children is, is some kind of special joy that for many people is the deepest joy that they'll ever have. Um, but with that, you know, comes so much struggle, so much difficulty, so much anxiety, sometimes tragedy. Um, you know, it, you know, connected to sexuality and, and raising children. Then often, you know, in that, that uh, we have this idea of the, of the mate as being our soul, you know, soul mate and so much joy and pleasure will be arrived through, uh, derived through that, through that uh, relationship. But we also see that it also is often the cause of the greatest pain, you know. Mm. And, and in any case, assuming that it's, you know, relatively smooth you know but the husband and wife they go through that life and they go through ups and downs they go they 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 get the joys but they get the anxiety you know and then also in the in the realm of business you know we're making money one day business seems to be doing good or my job seems to be like um something that i like and and and, and the benefits of it are nice I'm, I'm earning money i can buy the thing that i want and i'm deriving pleasure from that but that also brings tons of anxiety too. You know, business is doing good one day, and then I'm worried. Every, you know, sometimes heavy burdens of of anxiety connected to the workplace, connected to the business. And and from what I understand, is it's meant to work that way. You know, that that um, you you engage with the world in that way, and but because you went through brahmachari life, because you have that knowledge from before, you're beginning to see it all play out in your own life. And what was just theoretical at one point is now becoming more deeply realized, <laughs> you know. Mm. So just to, I mean, you are putting the broad, rather than specific teachings of the Bhagavatam, you are now talking about the uh, underlying worldview of the, or the underlying social structure that is that is pervasive in the Bhagavatam, and how it is that structure is relevant today. You know, we may not yeah. have need divisions of life into four ashramas but just being a part of the system in whatever way it works out for us that itself has its benefits so yeah i, I also experienced this that of course I, uh, my uh, my experience is not uh, through various ashrams that way but the, mm -hmm. the thing the thing is that uh, it's almost like the bhagavatam is giving us uh, a tool for or you could say a tool maybe a devaluing kind of word it's a resource it's a, maybe it's a, it's a tool for observing the world analyzing the world responding to the world and basically functioning better in the world and then yes. so we could say that ultimately that is what Krishna consciousness is also that for us the Bhagavatam is not just okay so what is this story and what is that story these stories, then the the underlying philosophy and the worldview through that, they help us look at life better and navigate it better. And irrespective of how much the social structure may have changed right now, the vision still remains valid and valuable, especially if we are able to separate the essential from the peripheral. Mm -hmm. So if we start taking everything from the Bhagavatam literally, then much of it might start seeming impractical. But if we don't take it that literally, if we, in one sense, like Prabhupada said, say Krishna consciousness is common sense. Mm -hmm. So if we use common sense, then there is a lot of 
could say lot of a uh, lot of value in the bhagavatam exactly for instance in other words it's no it's no big great revelation that generally people are students when they're young and then they get married and they enjoy and then they get retired you know like that's you know whatever society is is you know people are generally going through these different stages but what what we're getting from bhagavatam we're getting through varnash and dharma is that it's instilling certain ideas of duty in each of those stages and that if one embraces that it can help one progress in their understanding of what life is all about like where this is meant to go because for instance say i'm say i have no knowledge of all of this and i find myself in a marriage and then i find the marriage is getting rocky right um I, you know i tried you know i've had love for my kids but now they're teenagers and they're rebelling against me and every time they speak to me it seems like they just they hate me you know they don't, all that love that that i was experiencing before when they were younger is gone now and it's become a very difficult relationship and then the relationship with my spouse let's say is also rocky now too and you know the sexual enjoyment that we had that's no longer really there either and and even the it seems like you know there's difficulty in relating and now the two are at at odds with each other and you're saying what happened to life you know all my dreams of of a happy life seem to be crumbling and and many people go into severe depression uh, you know over these kind of issues but if you had been studying bhagavatam all along right at that point it may speak to you <laughs> you know like it, it all that you learned you know in your youth of study it begins to speak and say all along i was being told these lessons and although they seem kind of pessimistic to me before i see th th these books are telling me how they were meant to bring me to a higher level of understanding how they were to help me become detached um from the idea that i'll find my happiness through material enjoyment and that there is something much deeper um that that life is meant to discover and if one can think that way then even though they're going through very difficult circumstances it doesn't become overwhelming rather it actually becomes valuable the the very suffering that seems like it's um in just entirely problematic and, and um overwhelming one can begin to realize oh yes this is this is what i this is what i've always been taught about and now i'm the person in the story right it's no it's no longer a story about someone else but i'm the person in the story and now i get it i i have enjoyed life you know i have i have enjoyed family life and so on but i know there's something deeper and not only can those kind of realizations help make the the relationship smoother you know in the conversations and the the um whether it's relationships with the spouse or with the children or, or whatever but um you know in other words if both are thinking this way then we can begin not to place the same kind of demands for happiness you know expectations of happiness from that person and and actually our relationships can be much smoother but also it's really leading to that as as that arc of life is beginning you know it's reached its peak say in the mid 30s or something and then you start to come down and you realize it and you recognize it and rather than becoming depressed you're saying i want to dedicate my life to just to deeply discovering that spiritual truth to, to deeply discovering god and you really have the impetus it, you really get some genuine renunciation now because you've actually seen that everything that these books are telling me was true and and i really want to taste that other side of it that they're talking about mm. That's you know, I, I see like, yeah, I, I see, it's so it's just so common, you know, like um, marital problems that lead, lead to divorce because people aren't seeing marriage as, they're seeing marriage as a source of happiness rather than marriage as a stage in life that prepares you for deeper spiritual realization. And so as, you know, the, the couple ages, you know, they're worried there were the word you know about sexuality you know that, that which we we think is like so important for our happiness and we're getting older and it's not the same and the, and the the thrill of it is gone and so on and and they become confused and what to do now and so on whereas like if someone's been trained through bible time they realize oh let it go you know just we can let this go it's not a it's not a problem actually it's good that at this point in life we let go of that you know and, mm. and now we're ready to get to get really serious uh, you know um now now that i've now that i know not just theoretically but now that i know through my own experience that my idea of material happiness that 
it comes, it, it's, it's a combination of happiness and distress. There's, it, it's not just a theory that I'm hearing, but I know it. I've tasted it. I've felt it. I felt the joys of family life. And I've also felt the, the anxieties and the stress and, and the pain of it. And I'm ready to let it go. You know, so, so in, in this way, all these, you know, all, 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 that whole idea of going from brahmachari to grihasta and then to vanaprastha, you know, what, a, you know, someone's hit in their fifties, you know, in, in West, in the Western world and thinking, oh my God, I'm, everything's being lost now. You know, I never achieved what I, the, the level of happiness that I wanted to, and now it's all slipping away. If you have that spiritual knowledge, you're like, I'm entering to the best point of my life right now. You know, I have more time. I have more understanding. It's all making more sense to me. And you become very enthusiastic as you go into these years, you know. So, so although these ideas may sound outdated, it's actually, it's, it's really giving us some practical ideas of how to deal with the very struggles that we're dealing with in any age, you know. Hmm. So in a sense, what we are discussing here is that the the social structure that the Bhagavatam talks about it makes sense to the extent we try to we try to apply it in our life and live it and then we see that oh yeah this is actually helping me this is helping me so life is tough but this wisdom is at, at least ensuring that I don't make, make my life tougher than it needs to be I put it that way <laughs> And that, and that the toughness becomes meaningful because yeah. I, I wasn't looking if the toughness is completely disappointing and depressing if I thought that the point was to enjoy. But if I thought all along, if I had that adjusted in my minds and my expectations, like what am I expecting out of life? If I'm expecting material enjoyment, then I'm going to suffer. But if I'm expecting, if I see the purpose of life as a type of evolution, right, that I'm meant to evolve, then it's not difficult to put all the suffering in context of that and see how valuable it becomes. Hmm. And so Bhagavatam is, is helping us understand that and helping us understand it in terms of ashrama, what you're meant to gain in each stage, you know, what, what, you know how by embracing certain, um, certain, certain uh, duties, for instance, just that, the, the, take the idea of sexuality through media, right? As an American, I can easily, very easily get the idea that sex is the highest pleasure in life. Mm. And if I'm having, you know, a, a dynamic sexual life, then I'm a successful person. And if I'm not, well, then I'm one of the losers in the world. I'm going through life and missing out on something. And, and it's showing us these pictures of words, you know, through movies and, and so on that like, it does exist out there and certain people are experiencing a, a, a really joyful life, you know, and sexuality has so much to do with that. And then I, I realized that I never ha had it like on that level. I never had that exact kind of romance and I'm getting older and even whatever pleasure I did get out of it is slipping away. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it can be depressing and devastating for a person. But if I realize that sexuality is meant for one stage of life and it's not meant for the next stage of life, actually, actually you're meant to let go of it at a certain stage of life. Well, then it's just so much easier. You know, it's like, I don't have to become confused. I don't have to go through an identity crisis. I can hit it in stride and say, mm. oh, this is great now. You know, I, that, I did that. It was, it was beautiful. It was fun. It was, you know, um, it, it, but it, but it, along with the joys came the pains. And now my body can't maintain it anymore. Uh, you know, I, I won't, I won't be able to pursue that so well. That's okay. You know, I'll let that go there's something else that's really important about life. Life isn't becoming empty. There's something else that's really dynamic and important about life that I'm going to experience right now. So what you that's this is, pressed, yeah. You know, this is interesting that uh, to some extent uh, in modern society, or we could say postmodern, whatever, sex is both highly glamorized and also highly trivialized. In the sense that yes. incess incess incessantly being uh, depicted in the media. But then, uh, by trivialized, it means there was a certain, in pre-modern society, there was a certain gravitas. Not everybody followed rules of sexual morality. But still, there was a certain level of gravitas to it. And that mm. it's a 
it's something which is uh, generally within the sanctified bonds of marriage and not just sanctimonious in the sense of being holier than thou but it is an activity that has the potential to bring new life into the world so even if you put the moral dimensions aside it is just that it has become on one side so trivialized and the same it, it's just like something people just you have a drink and then you indulge on indulge in it it's yeah. it's almost become it's almost become such a something that is done so nonchalantly at the same time it is glamorized incessantly yeah. so <laughs> so so the the point i was making is that in some ways for many people any religious tradition or any religious text that seems to to infringe on their sexual freedom is something which is a absolute no no i have no i, I don't want anything to do with this mm-hmm. and the bhagavatam does seem to be quite strong about uh, this so how do so there are so many sections i don't know if you come to the sections where um, there is a yati section or there are various sections like that so how do you present those sections where where the where the all the problems associated with it uh, sexual infatuation are talked about and i could i say in one sense the whole world is also talking about those problems movies don't just romanticize and glamorize sex they also talk about breakup and heartbreak and all those things but in spite of that the idea of regulating it or transcending it is not something which uh, which is popular it is yes there are a lot of problems but one day you will get lucky and you will find the right partner and then you will be happy <laughs> yeah that, that is the way it is you know i believe that a lot of people are ready particularly you know like i think our listeners are our largest um age um group of our listeners what do they call it the um i forget in any case you know like the, if you break down the the different age groups that are listening the demographic the demographics thank you yeah, yeah our, our largest you know our most um populous demographic for our listeners is 35 to 45 years old um okay. you know whereas i think a lot of well in any case just taking the significance of that i think a lot of our listeners are ready to hear that right in other words yeah i i have experimented in life you know i have had sex i have had children i've had you know i have gone through the ups and downs the um grand ideas as a as a teenager that i had of what life might be never materialized and um and i have had pleasures but i have actually had pains too and i i'm i'm i will embrace if you can give me a a um a better way of looking at this you know um i i i'm happy to receive it so in other words sexuality i'm i'm not so much as a as a 40 year old man or woman i might be really ready to hear hey you know what you enjoyed sex and you also suffered because of it and that's part of life um but there's so much more to life and it's wide and the and that door is wide open to you once you can put all this in perspective once you can realize that this life wasn't meant you know even when you get that enjoyment that it doesn't satisfy the soul but what we're offering here is something that does i think people are quite ready to hear that you know that's that's what i'm seeing so mm. it's not that it it doesn't have to, it's not that you have to tiptoe around that um for a lot of people a lot of people want you know i think a lot of people do want to hear that that's interesting we are putting it that uh, that there is there is a certain level of openness to it and uh, there is a disadvantage of course that that when when people become sexually active very at a very young age then you could say they lose the innocence of innocence of childhood or early youth or whatever but it's after some time they also realize that okay there's has to, is there anything more than this so in a sense uh for them if they find something higher it's it's more of a personal choice than a, like a mandated rule or regulation yes yeah, that, that's a very good way to put it yeah hmm and then if that is presented that way then it, it there is not it's you you chose it yourself so the resentment and stuff like that is not there so much associated with it there, there's the rebellion to 
and I, I want to be That's a nice way of this. putting it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but there's, a, there's a rebellion to, like, for instance, um, you were raised in India, I was raised in, in the West. And so I was mm. raised in a Christian tradition. And often that, that tradition, its ideas about sexuality are being handed down um, in a sense that, like, you're not allowed to do that. And, and it, because it's um, sinful, and it leads to hell. And it puts a person in a very difficult position, right? Like, why did God give us this enjoyment and then not allow us to engage in it? Mm. And why is it sinful, you know, and, and so on. Whereas when you go to Bhagavatam or, or you go to the Eastern traditions, it can give you a more nuanced understanding that first of all, let's, let's, re let's, let's try to understand what life is all about and see it in that context. Again, if you think that life is for material enjoyment, then you're going to become very attached to the idea of, of finding that enjoyment. And if anyone's going to tell you not to f dive headfirst into enjo material enjoyment, you're going to see that as an imposition on, on your happiness. But if you have another paradigm, if you have another paradigm that life, that that is not the point of life, but that life is meant for an evolution of consciousness, just starting right there, well, then you can see everything very differently, you know, um, that, 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 and then the stricture from that context, the strictures of Bhagavatam and of Varnashram, they're actually quite generous in the sense that they're saying, go ahead at this stage of your life between whatever, like 18 and 50 or something like that. Right. Go ahead. And it's open for material enjoyment. Um, it's even dharmic, right? It, it's, 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 it's certainly allowed, but do it in an informed way. Do it in a way that at every stage, your realizations about life, uh, your realizations about yourself are becoming deeper, deeper, deeper. Realize that you, in one sense, you're playing with fire a little bit when you deal with money, when you deal with sex and these things as a yogi. But if you have the right background and you have the right association and the, and the right social structure, you'll pass through it. And by, when you come out the other side, you're going to be so much more detached from, from material life than you could imagine. So when you hit 50 years old, you're a person that's done with the idea of material enjoyment. You've, you're, you're actually a sannyasi, you know, in the sense that you, you, you've let go of the idea that this, this is where happiness comes from. And now you're really eager you know, and, and, and ideally you have more time. Now that, that's not always the case in the world that we live in now, right? Where you're working late into your life. And it's not that you have children that are supporting you when you're 50 years old or something like that, that you're necessarily ready to retire. But ideally you've renounced, you, you, you've let go internally of, of a lot of the desires that you had. That is a huge thing. That is a huge success, right? If that's how you became a, you know, probably, um, not Prabhupada, Krishna in the Gita is going to say the real sannyasi, right, is doing their duties uh, in this world, but with detachment. You know, they're the real, they're the real sannyasi, they're the real yogi. If you can get to that point, you know, say in your mid 40s or 50s, in one sense, you're on a good path. <laughs> you're like, you're really, really developed. You know, and, and you've got your realization city, you know. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's so much there, you know, again, as I'm passing through the, say, the Grihasta ashram, which is maybe the most relevant, right? That, that's probably going to become the most relevant ashrama for, for, for people that are studying this and, and, and wanting to be transformed by it. Understanding what it means to be a good husband, what it means to be a good wife, you know, what it means to be a good parent. And when it comes to my occupation, uh, and we can, you know, also speak about Varna, but understanding that how, how important my occupation is, uh, learning to, to embrace all these duties, they become my sacrifice, right? They become where I don't listen to my mind. My mind is telling me, run off and do this, but I'm embracing what it means to be a father. I'm embracing what it means to be a husband. I'm embracing what it means to be an ethical person. Um, that's mm -hmm. sacrifice. That bec and, and when that, when you, t you were speaking, when we spoke, uh, on, on, uh, uh, this past weekend, you you mentioned that we all have two identities, right? The the uh, functional and the phone, yeah, 
in the foundational. So the functional is our duties in this world, our, our very worldly duties. And our, and our fundamental is our spiritual truth that lies underneath it, that's eternal, that never changes. Mm -hmm. And so what Bhagavatam is doing is it's saying, whether you read Bhagavatam or not, you're going to have all these functional things that you have to do in life. And they're going to bring you pleasure and they're going to bring you pain. Recognize that the pleasure and pain that come from them is not what life is all about. But if you can embrace those and see them as a process of evolution and tie it all in to your fundamental identity so that being a husband, being a father, being a business person, being a mother, being, you know, a, a wife, what, whatever, that, that I'm going to embrace these as a method of uncovering my fundamental nature, as a, as a method of, as an offering to God, as a method of um, my dormant um, Krishna Bhakti arising in me. It all becomes very meaningful. And this is what I have absolute faith in. It's not just talk. It actually really works. <laughs> you know, I see it working in the lives of people. Um, I see people, you know, going through, going through the ups and downs of life, learning to tolerate them rather than, rather than chase, you know, chasing enjoyment or running away from suffering, just embracing it all, tolerating the ups and downs, tying it all in and, and actually becoming deeply spiritual people. I see it work. Mm. So oh. if, if that's what we can highlight, you know, when you're reading these stories, if, if it's that kind of transformation that we can highlight, then it all becomes relevant, I find. True. So, so in one sense, the book uh, has to be studied with somebody who is actually living the book. Otherwise, one will be overwhelmed by the, the, the foreign elements which are there in it. Or even something can seem even alien. Of course, if somebody mm. is a genuine, is a serious seeker, they may still be able to look, find something relevant and essential in it. But it's a, that's why, the, in one sense, the tradition says the Bhagavad has to be the book Bhagavad has to be studied with the, the person Bhagavad. Yeah, so, so important. So that we, at one level we can say that the person Bhagavad is a pure devotee, but on another level it is also anyone who is trying to mold their life according to the Bhagavatam. Mm. And uh, so. There is, uh, if we consider the book in isolation from the life that a person is living, then the, the book can seem, as I said, incomprehensible. But if we bring the, so that, that's the essence of like, finding the, as you could say, practical and the scriptural. Shri Prabhupada also not so interested in, if you look at his purports, there are many technical sections of the Bhagavatam which he doesn't focus on. Say, for example, there are descriptions of some sacrifices that some are performed. And there, okay, this mantra was chanted and this was done and this was done. And Prabhupada just skips through that. He doesn't mm. give any elaborate purports to that. Mm. So, in, so Prabhupada's focus also seems to be on the principles of living spiritually and how those can be relevant, yeah. uh, how those can be highlighted rather. So, in one sense... Because the we could say the world has changed slightly, the audience has slightly or substantially. The world, the the audience thinks differently. So we may have to use slightly different terminology, slightly different uh, ways of presenting. But in a sense, it is Prabhupada who is like the who is who has set the example of how to show the Bhagavatam as a guidebook for living. I have to find a value within the Bhagavatam. And it seems that Prabhupada's idea about that wasn't merely on the individual level too, but he was also reaching out to like try to like save the world, you know, like to, yeah. to, to actually alter the history, you know, of the world through through the teachings of the Bhagavatam, which, you know, gets really interesting and, and probably brings us to the idea of, of Varna, you know, which he speaks so much about. Mm. True. Like, like that's another area where it might seem entirely alien. You know, I, I got a job and I, you know, I think when people start to engage with that idea, they, they think, okay, well, what are, what are my interests or what are my aptitudes? Am I doing the right job? And mm -hmm. that's, that's certainly part of our ashram. But I think even our ability, to, if, if we, if we're not somewhat learned and um, immersed in the, in this knowledge, really, we may just be talking about what our inclinations are, our conditioned inclinations that we, we may be way off. 
but it actually is such a brilliant science. And where this, to me, this is real important. And I, I think, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, we're saying, you know, kind of, I feel our role on Wisdom of the Sages is to kind of get past that surface level understanding of what we're talking about it and get a little deeper and see the practicality of it. And I think when it comes to Varna, it's immediately going to seem, it, it's immediately going to trigger people. One reason is because uh, it's a system that's been abused in the history of India. Um, and or used, as, let's say, as a tool of oppression. And another reason is that, in general, I don't feel like being categorized or, or um, uh, having dictated to me how I should be living. Hmm. But if we can get past that surface triggering and look at the problems of the world today, I think that Varnashram has tremendously, you know, a lot of people say, um, okay, I think we need that, <laughs> you know, like, I think, I think we could use more of that in this world. You know, I, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but for, for years now, for many, quite a few years, I've been speaking, um, in yoga circles. Hmm. And whenever I would speak about Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata, um, I would always have to be a little careful uh, because the reaction to violence, people's immediate, as yogis, pe people's response, triggered response to violence is how, how it's, it's almost like it's always unjust. And so you discuss something like the vows that the Pandavas took, you know, um, at the dice match before they went off to the forest. And it can just sound like that's just brutal and it, people that are out of touch. But, but um, the, the, there was a certain very distinct shift in attitude I found after the Me Too movement, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that after, I really saw this, you know, it was, I, I was getting a very different response. Like when, when I describe what these horrible men put Draupadi through, that people are ready to hear that, yeah, we want someone to take a vow that they're going to come back and, and deal with these people, right? Even kill them, right? It's like someone's got to stand up and put an end to this. And I think a lot of the, the tensions and the problems in this world, you know, whether it be a, about, you know, um, climate change, whether it be a, a, about you know, war, whether it be I have to do with racial or gender issues, whether it have to do with economic issues. I think that Varnashram has really important answers to these problems. And that as things get worse, people become more open to, to these ideas. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. true. In one sense, if, if modern progress had been all that it is touted to be, people would not be turning to the past to explore wisdom from there. Yeah. And while we can always say that nothing is a fully a good thing or a bad thing and that always mixed, mixed things, but there's definitely a lot which needs to be rectified. And yes, the Bhagavatam stands ready with the wisdom. So in one sense, what the Bhagavatam is saying that it's Purana Arka Dinodita, it's like a torchlight for this dark age of Kali. It's like the, it is yeah. like the sun which has risen. So to some extent, we can say that there are people in darkness and the Bhagavatam is like the sunlight. But it is for us to show that how this is the sunlight which can show you Okay, this can show the path to you. Otherwise, the sunlight, my sun might be there, but how it is showing the path? If you don't show it, then it will become a problem. Yeah, so, you know. exactly. Right. So yeah. So how do these apparently antiquated ideas? How do they become relevant? And how, and not only that, how do how can they be presented in a way where like people are eager to embrace them, or people say, yeah, that's what we need. Like you know, like I think a lot of devotees when they think about Varnashram, they think about a farm and they think yeah. oh, well how are we going to introduce this to the world and they think let's and i'm all for that i'm 100 percent like behind that please you know start farms and protect cows and and i think it's i do think it's very much needed but i think there's a there's other ways to think about Varnashram too um yes. and, and even ways that don't um 
that won't necessarily take decades and decades and decades to well they could it, it, their full manifestation but for instance like when i look at varnashram and i try to apply it to the world that i'm living in i think i get it you know like i think in other words it's about leadership you know and that leaders need to be trained mm. and you know, just sorry sorry yeah. pause you yeah, over here mm -hmm. i was thinking that varnashram itself is a big subject and yeah. we didn't come to that so yeah. we could have a separate podcast on that if you like and yeah. maybe if you want you can make a mention a few points over here because varanasi was a very interesting subject and how it apply how the concept of varanas to do some extent we discuss about the ashramas but varanas themselves are a big concept so sure and i don't claim to be an expert on it <laughs> you know like i say i'm not a scholar on these things but what what, what i yeah. feel like my you know anyway how how it works in my own life and how i try to explain it to people is just yes, there there very basic concepts in it you know like just like if we read these books and we think okay a vaishya is like a farmer yes but really farming was the from what i understand farming was the the center of the economy then so really mm -hmm. what a you know a vaishya is is like what in a, in the united states the term we use now is job creator right like they're the employers they're the business owners they don't you know the key to all the leaders the the vaishya the kshatriya the vaishyas are like the economic leaders right they employ people they they are not employed by others but they own their own business they have the passion to strike out in the world and they're not in, independently create their own business and they employ others and the kshatriya is someone it's almost like um you probably didn't grow up with this but like here in the united states we grew up with these western movies you know like mm. you've heard i'm sure you've heard yeah i heard about definitely westerns right and a, a lot of time the issue in these films were like cuz th this was like a lot of them take place out in the western part of the united states before it was fully um kind of civilized you know mm. and, and so there are criminals and there are native americans there is you know there's always a threat of violence there's always the threat of, threat of your your town be, you know becoming you know um invaded in in some way and someone had to step up and be the sheriff you know and in one sense it was like the strongest man you know that had the, the courage to to put the badge on and say okay i'm going to bring law and order and so the church is the person that's responsible for law and order and they govern and and they're also independent right they're not they're not hired by someone they go out there and they on their own with their own passion and their own initiative they become a social leader and a governor but the idea was so those are there both of those are independent and then the brahmana is independent and the brahmana their role is based especially to advise the vaishya the economic leader and the and the chatriya who is the um kind of like the social law and order leader and if and it, you either fit in one of those three positions or if you're employed by someone else you're shudra you're you're in a sense you're dependent and mm. but but my but you see like if i look at the situation in the united states right now i and people get this that big corporations are taking over everything right it's it's like if you if you you know even in my own life which is just oh, you know 56 years i've seen how in the past if you wanted to have your own business if you wanted to let's say you wanted to open up your own shop that's based on your own interest in life like let's say you're interested in books So okay, you know what? I think I would like to have a bookstore. And, and nowadays it's very hard to have a bookstore because you're going to have to compete with Amazon and you're going to have to compete with mm -hmm. Barnes and Noble and it's there's you don't see these uh, you know uh bookstores anymore because you, you have these these corporate powerful influential people in the corporate world that are just taking over everything. And they don't care so much about the people because their idea of success has to do with how much money they have but what if the corporate leaders what if the entrepreneurs were trained with a certain type of values right what if even from a young age that society in general and and a brahminical element of society in particular were investing ideas so that the entire society accepted it became clear in society that the glory of the entrepreneur right is how well they care for others how charitable they are how well they care for their own workers 
and how charitable they are in society. And the person, and even if that became an ego thing for them, that's okay because it's helping them kind of be more generous. It's bringing the good out of them and it's helping society. So nowadays you have people that are making incredible, incredibly huge amounts of money, but they don't necessarily feel that their reputation is based on how good they are to others, how good they are to the workers, for instance. Mm. And so people's hours are just getting ridiculously long. And I work full time at a job and I still don't have enough to pay to, to, you know, for my home and for my family. So people are under incredible amounts of stress. And then these corporate leaders just find ways to make more money off that. You know, but, but what if they had a different set of values? Wouldn't the world be a better place? And what if that was coming from people that lived so simply that they were practically incorruptible, right? That, 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 that the, the leadership, the, the ultimate, the ethical leadership was coming from people that lived, you know, incredibly simple, austere lives mm. because their faith was so deep and their knowledge was so deep. And naturally, mm. you know, we respected that, you know. Couldn't that have a very positive influence? Couldn't that help solve a lot of our problems? Mm. So again, what we are doing is the specific structure might seem unfamiliar, but if you go to the values underlying in the structure, those values are relevant because it's not just relevant, we could say they're essential. They could be very powerfully, positively transformational in today's world. Yeah. So this, is, yeah this is a fascinating exercise in one sense that uh, we... Bhakti Thakur talks about Saragrahi, you know, essence seeker. So essence seeker is not just uh, like looking at the philosophical essence, but you can see also looking at the practical essence. How does this, uh, what, is the, what is the essential meaning of this? But what does it mean today? Or what does it mean to me? What does yeah. it mean, mean for those people I am speaking to? So when we have that approach, I think we can, we can make scripture relevant and reach a lot of people. And this whole framework of Aranashram, in one sense, it is very otherworldly, but in another sense, it is very immediately relevant, the way you present yeah. it. So that it, if you see Varanashram less as a structure and more as values, then the values are, of course, the structure is important in its own place. But even if we can't replicate the structure immediately, at least we can strive to uh, foster the values. And if those values are fostered, then that can make a positive difference in society. So. And that fostering of values is really the work of the brahmana, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think as devotees, like as followers of Srila Prabhupada, <clears throat> I always think this is so significant that commonly we see many instances, right, where Prabhupada was asked by an interviewer, you know, why did you come to the West? Mm -hmm. what, you know, why are you here? And he would give answers um, that they may not have really kind of understood, but as his father, I, I think I understand where he would say, I've come to create um, first-class men. Yes. Or he would say, so that's, they, they may have had no idea about Varnash and what that meant, but what I mean, what I understand that means, I've come to create Brahmanas. I've come to create the, the people that are gonna give society um, values, you know, ethics, the people that are gonna have very good character themselves, that are gonna become very learned, and that are going to be able to share values with people, convince people about the needs of these values in their own life and how these play out in, in a broader society. I've come to create a group of people that can live very pure lives and speak truth in a way that it will instill good values in society. That's why I've come to the West, right? Or sometimes mm -hmm. you would say, I've come to give your society, I've come to give you a brain, <laughs> right? Uh, in other words, I've come to create the Brahmanas, that, that part of the, the body of the social structure that had has deep pure thoughts and so when we talk about varnashram i'm totally into that I, I i deeply admire and appreciate that there are devotees that are creating farm communities and and, and on, on that level but i also think that we're serving the idea of varnashram when we become a thought leaders in society uh, and particularly when we the more we can fully embrace that idea that like i'll live simply and even more so, you know, I'll live off, if one can live off the donations of others even, you know, then you're, you're really getting into that Brahminical role where I'm free to speak, right? I'm free to speak the truth and I'm free to try to help people understand important values in life that they'll benefit from and society will benefit from. I, I see Prabhupada as wanting to create that and that should be manifesting in terms of people writing books 
and people offering seminars and people becoming life coaches even and and um becoming teachers in different fields that that the world needs to be engaging with spiritual values and Prabhupada mm -hmm. was trying to create a, a generation you could say of people that were going to do that so that a lot of the stuff that i never learned as a child i think i should have learned but because there was a lack of a brahminical presence in society i never engaged with these ideas True. But some somehow that has to seep in, you know, some, it may be through a, a film, you know, someone's got to write that script. It may be through a book. It, it may be through, um, uh, you, you know, some influential person becoming influenced by another person mm -hmm. that we begin to say, hey, we need to start to th think about um, what's the difference between a living person and a dead person. You know, we need to start to think about, you know, um, and, and you know, these, if you take all the hot button issues right now, abortion, racism, racism, economic equality, there's spirituality speaks very clearly to all of these issues. Mm. And and this so, is also something so, which, yeah. again, what we, the problems that we are facing in the world today, in the specifics, yeah. may be different from what they were faced. Of course, economic inequality is always there, but we could say racism and other things, but the principles are always applicable and to some extent that is our responsibility as teachers of the as students and teachers of the Bhagavatam to show its relevance hmm? sure I was thinking that this could also be a separate topic which you could discuss at some level mm -hmm. in future hmm? but um, uh, should I try to summarize now you want to add any sure points? You know, I think this is no 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 I, I guess maybe just on that last point yeah, please, please go ahead. That, that um, in one sense, like if as a follower of Srila Prabhupada, I, again, I'm one of these uh, idealistic kind of followers, right? I believe that, that uh, what Prabhupada gave us, he had, a, he had an intention to change the world. And I think that we can change the world. <laughs> I'm 100% behind that. Um, and I think that it's not as complicated or as impossible as we might think. But that we should have faith in spiritual knowledge that it's not that we're necessarily going to turn everyone into a krishna devotee you know what to speak of overnight but that our job you know if you look at the first at the first um purpose of um iskan of the seven purposes you know it has to do with propagating spiritual knowledge you know teaching spiritual knowledge and values so that it can bring about peace in the world and I think that there's something so deeply profound about the understanding that we are not this body, that we are a spark of spiritual energy, and therefore there's an equality on a spiritual level across humanity and even across all life. Um, and just that very most fundamental, simple idea that I never learned as a child, I only learned it through Srila Prabhupada coming and bringing it. Um, mm -hmm. That, that that should be engaged with in schools right that 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 idea should be that that idea and the tradition from which that idea comes from there really shouldn't be anyone in this world that's unaware of that 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 should be something that everyone should at least know about and have the opportunity to engage with and consider and as if as as Prabhupada's followers we can somehow bring that very fundamental spiritual idea in a very prominent way, seeping in whatever ways that we can. Sometimes they'll, it's coming from this direction or that direction. You know, someone's getting it in a song and someone's getting it in a film and someone's learning it from a teacher. But at a certain point, there's a tipping point where people are like, this makes a, a whole lot of sense. And the more that you think about it, the more that it solves, it, it, we can see that this is being a, a way of solving a lot of our problems. Then, then our mission is just to try to serve that some, in some way. And, and in a way, that's what it means to be a Brahmin. And in a way, that's what it means to be a follower of Srila Prabhupada. And, and, and that is serving Varnashram, being, being a Brahmin and, and bringing this spiritual idea into the world. So let's find ways. Let's get creative. If we can, if we can in a sense, focus on that idea, let's find creative ways to bring that idea um, more prominently in, into the world, into, in, whether it be through schools, whether it be through um, uh, arts, whether it be through politics or, or the, the social realms, 
uh, let's find a way, let's all find our own way to kind of bring that idea more deeply. Maybe I'm just sharing it with another individual. But I think that's, that's the idea that changes the world. And we all can play a role in, um, in making that happen. Yes, from sure. that's a, that's a, you could say a part of the lofty vision that Prabhupada had you know, towards the end of his not that to the last few years Prabhupada really looked forward for his uh, for his disciples to arrange meetings with influential leaders, and yeah. he tried to share the thoughts of the Bhagavatam with them, mm -hmm. and uh, in some ways uh, we all depend on Krishna for whatever opportunity we get to share his message. But then another sense, if we keep sharing somewhere, we get in touch with somebody who is influential. And then uh, and then through that, a channel can open up and it can be a huge, it can make a huge difference. That's why I think that's what we can hope for. I'm, I'm is, with you, yeah. I, I think as things get crazier, like in a pandemic, we've got an answer for it. You know, like spirituality speaks to that. You know, abortion, spirituality speaks to that. Racism, spirituality speaks to that. You know, mm. economic oppression, spirituality speaks to that. At a certain point, it's going to start to click in more and more heads. You know, that that the other answers don't work, and that only when we take it sure. to the spiritual level does it actually work. Yes, bro. Wonderful. So let me try to summarize what we discussed today. We started by discussing primarily about, you know, finding the practical and the scriptural, and then you said that. We, when we approach scripture, the whole idea is that it is everybody is going to look for something to improve their life. And that's not self-serving because it's not so much why we are approaching scripture specifically, but what are we doing after approach, getting the knowledge from scripture? So if somebody is not using it for just exploiting others, then that is always positive. And within that, we discussed about, say, the whole concept of uh, the ashrams may not seem so immediately relevant, but how the wisdom that we learn in the Brahmacharya ashram through service and we get we can apply that and realize that more in the Grahast ashram, and in that sense, in today's world where so social traditional social structures are crumbling, this wisdom can act like a, a guiding light for us. So. Bhagavatam is like a tool that helps us process the world. And in that connection, we discussed about the whole, whole aspect of uh, sexuality. That while it is, it promises so much pleasure, but at the same time, there is so much trouble with it. And people are open if it is presented in a, in a way that is reasonable, that it is, uh, if people are open to looking for something beyond it. Because they have experienced the frustration of it also. And then we talked about Varana and how basically three Varanas are leaders. So instead of considering say Vaishya like a, somebody might call them a lower Varana, but they are actually job creators in the world. Similarly, like Kshatriyas and Brahmanas are leaders. And Brahmanas are especially those who understand the values and share those values and te teach those values to others. And especially if we consider the problems facing the world today, so Varanashram as a structure may take some time to implement Varanashram set of values or definitely is um, something which is eminently relevant. And uh, I'm quickly summarizing actually we went a lot of details and a lot of things we discussed. <laughs> and also, especially the current problems that the world is facing, you know, we have insights that can help deal with those problems. So whether it's pandemic, whether it's racial discrimination, whether it is economic inequity. So we can just we can hope to become instruments for sharing the wisdom of the Bhagavatam as far as possible and thus bring about a positive change in the world. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> wonderful talking with Always you. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank Great. you. True, you're a true Brahmana. You know, you're, oh, you're, you're, like that too. No, so much. So. You're Thank you. Knowledge into the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.